Hello and welcome to StarCast from Planet Waves. My name is Eric Francis Coppolino, the author of the Planet Waves horoscope and essay series and host of Planet Waves FM on Pacifica Radio. Today is Thursday, the 13th of... What month is it? June 2024. What year is it? It is good to be with you. Uh, I took a week off from... Uh, recording last week. Thank you. Uh, that was good. I'm doing my best to dial it back a little bit right now, even though it doesn't seem like that. I've got the horoscope running, and I'm writing pretty juicy articles every week, but I have found that the trick to the trade is getting the horoscopes done and to the proofreaders like a month in advance. That that suddenly sets me free to do things like get in my car and go someplace and maybe not have to come back that night. Anyway, it is good to be with you. This is the edition that accompanies the June 13th weekly horoscope as well as the June 13th article. The title of that article is, what is the title of that article? Title of, anyway, ah, it's, it's, the, it's about series and the Hunger Games. Uh, there is a concentration of planets in early Capricorn that I'm going to talk about in a second. But first, a couple of house announcements. Um, there will not be a Planet Waves FM this week. I'm taking yet another week off of the program. I plan to return with a program on the solstice next Friday. That is to say, not the 14th, but the 21st, uh, with my voice well rested and, um, and, and um, certain important things in my life. Uh, better and things like that. So it's been great to have a, uh, a, a few weeks to myself on Fridays. And um, I'll, I'll be adjusting the format of the program of the, for, the, for the summer, but nothing that uh, anybody would notice, most likely. Okay, also, uh, I will be venturing into a project called Trust Yourself, named for a Bob Dylan song, by the way. Uh, and that is the mid-year reading. Uh, for those who have purchased that or may purchase it, I'm going to do this one in audio. There will be a video introduction. Uh, I am just right now very averse to sitting in front of a video camera and being looked at. I prefer the relative kind of visual privacy of audio, but I also think that my message comes across more clearly in audio when there's not this like hypnotic video screen uh, dancing around in front of your eyes. I, I know people uh, may uh, differ on that point. Who, who knows uh, what is really true, though for me it is, it is easier, and I think I will do a better reading uh, in audio format. So Trust Yourself are 12 sign readings. Um, I, I will be looking at the astrology of the second half of 2024 leading into 2025. Uh, the annual readings in the spring reading mainly focused on the astrology out to approximately July. Um, and, uh, and then th that's where all the really obvious stuff was. Then we get into some quite subtle things that are happening in, in the second half of the year. Um, as compared to all of the fireworks and fanfare of the total solar eclipse and the Jupiter-Uranus conjunction and um, and all of that. Anyway, I am planning to have that in July, definitely in the first half of July. And again, that is called Trust Yourself, and we're introducing uh, double sign sales, that is to say two for the price of one, uh, beginning today. So check your email for that. And if you have any questions about it, write to me at EFC at planetwaves.net or leave a question in the comments wherever you may be reading this. All right, let's talk about the astrology of the, of well, uh, let me, let's talk a little bit about the astrology of the moment. And then I will go into what I, I did this week, which was somewhat unusual article uh, for this stage of Planet Waves history, unusually long and detailed in the astrology. But first, quickie quick, here's a look at what's going on at our moment. I'm recording at 11.57 on Thursday morning here in what is now sunny, still cool, Kingston, New York. All right. Uh, moon is at first quarter. So today, into this evening, the moon will make 90 degree angle or square moon in Virgo to Mercury in 
Gemini, followed by the Sun in Gemini. That makes it first quarter, then Moon square Venus in Gemini. Uh, so it, this is uh, first quarter. It is a, a bright, fresh feeling. Usually, uh, first quarter there's a sense of uh, optimism and balance. It's really, in terms of the lunar cycle, it's one of the best times of the month because it mitigates all of the extremes of the new, the extreme introversion of the new moon, the extreme extroversion of the full moon. It's got a good balance. And here we have moon in mutable sign Virgo, making. Uh, squares to planets in the mutable signs again mercury sun and venus now the the if you if you look in astrology textbooks it's an interesting exercise to look at what squares from the moon to a planet do now the moon is fairly harmless um, it can be troublesome when it is in a, a tense angle to something like Pluto or Neptune, um, and it, it'll it'll we'll get to the Moon opposite Neptune in a second because that's how uh, that's how this run is uh, is is going to end uh, sometime on Friday. Uh, so Moon square Mercury is the the question of whether your intuition works. Is this really the right thing? Uh, am I going to second guess myself? Do I need more data? That's an interesting question, and speaking as a journalist who does a lot of astrology, excuse me, as an astrologer who does a lot of journalism, uh, and journalism re requires a combination of hunches that are confirmed by the facts, I would say that really what you're going for is, is not the hunch that contradicts the facts, not the facts that contradicts the hunch, but it's not so hard to get them both in the same place. And this re requires understanding what intuition really is. And I would say that intuition is the gentle tug to go one way or the other. I am not so big into this gut thing, except when it is presenting a significant warning, like, I can't do that. Uh, for example, the other day, I was up in the I was up in the Catskills and um, I I got up in time to photograph sunrise from the escarpment where the Catskill Mountain House used to be and uh, it was only like you know five well maybe fifteen minute car ride from from my motel I got there with all my camera equipment and I I parked my car way at the back of the parking lot in the in the trailhead. And I'm sitting there, and I've been up on this cliff in the dark before. I know how to find it in the dark with my gear. And my body just wouldn't get out of the car and go up there. Maybe it had something to do with the, uh, the, the night being a little bit brooding and there being a bit of wind and it was a moonless night and all of that. Uh, but I, I, I just didn't, uh, didn't, I didn't want to go. That that is that is intuitive, but it's also deeper than intuitive. And so, I'm often interested in following exactly what it is my body does. Like if I get up and I start to leave, that's like something besides my ordinary conscious mind uh, decided that it was time to get up and leave. And that's like maybe it exactly is. Uh, so I, I didn't I didn't go up to the cliffside to photograph sunrise on Wednesday morning. Um, I, I don't know what fabulous photos I, I missed, but I was just sitting there and I looked out at the trailhead and it looked at me and I looked at the forest and the forest looked at me and basically I was not being invited in. And I think it is very important to follow that when it happens, I certainly could have forced myself. I certainly could have said, "No, I am rising above my fear and gotten all my stuff and uh, and and uh, you know walked out to the cliff." Uh, it's, it's only about a quarter of a mile walk through, you know, perfectly dark woods at uh, three thirty in the morning. Uh, but I'll, I will I will try again another time. So that's Moon Square Mercury, and and I, I think that. It is important to listen to those gut reactions, kind of like I had sitting in my car on Wednesday morning, 
But intuition is often subtler. Intuition is more like the thing that whispers. And as I said a moment ago, it should comport with the facts, even though I had no specific facts about what was going on in that forest at 3.30 in the morning. It just felt a little bit Twin Peaks to me. Okay, so moon square sun, no arguments there. Anytime the moon is applying to the sun, you've got something positive to work with. So um, as my old teacher David Arner said, <laughs> moon square sun, Moon moon approaching sun. Moon applying to sun. Always good. All right, fine, great. Okay, next, um, moon square Venus. So moon square Venus is the question of uh, what are your emotional needs? Uh, are your emotional needs aligned uh, with reality? Um, is, is there... Uh, I'm not I'm not a big fan of the term needy, but we all think we know what it means. And the question is, you know, is is what you perceive as a need really a need? Okay, so the, that that's all that. Now I'm I'm slightly ahead of myself here uh, because there are there's actually an aspect that is is going to be developing through Thursday afternoon Eastern time. It's probably already happened by the time you've you've gotten this, but before the moon makes those squares to the Gemini group, it will make an opposition to Saturn, which is conjunct Nessus. Both of those are in Pisces. Now, the Saturn-Nessus conjunction. This is not an easy one to describe. It's going to get another article similar to the one we have today that I'm going to talk about in a second. But Saturn conjunct Nessus is putting some pressure on us to, on us, everyone, uh, to... Consider the consequences and of whatever you might be, whatever might bubble up, and also to uh, do what you can to act based on an understanding of what those consequences might be. So there's something there about kind of it's a, it's a look before you leap, and it's also recognizing that actions you've taken in the past may have consequences. Uh, but that does not mean that the consequences are in any way fixed. That that is to say, you may have plenty that you can do uh, to to mitigate those results. And uh, the idea is to take timely action um, when you have the chance. And to remember, as uh, my old friend Robert von Heeren said of Nessus, came up with a very clever. What was that? No, this is Melanie Reinhardt. I, I, I sometimes get confused because we were all kind of in one long conversation. Melanie's delineation of a uh, good friend of Robert. Many's, Melanie's delineation of Nessus is the buck stops here. So there's something about taking responsibility for, uh, for, for what you experience whenever Nessus is in the picture. Okay, enough moon aspects uh, for now besides moon trine series. Let's talk about the content of this week's article. So this week's uh, article is a long discussion of a five-point conjunction happening in early Capricorn. Uh, this is not the normal thing you can read about in any astrology publication. Uh, something like uh, the Mountain Astrologer, if it still exists, would not go in, into that. This is not uh, made for a blog or made for a podcast. And besides, there's hardly anyone who is delineating all these points who can put them all together. And so I am delineating a... And there's a picture of uh, how, how I show it in the chart, and it's in every chart... If I, I stop putting in the whole charts because nobody said anything about them, I think that they're really beautiful and I would distribute them large enough to print. But no one ever said a single word about these charts that I uh, I was publishing. So I stopped uh, I stopped issuing them and I would go back to it with one one request to to do so. Uh, anyway, I've put a close up of that group in, and the group consists of the slow moving part of the group consists of. A uh, quayar, which is quaoar, quayar. Not sure how that's pronounced. Which is a, a point associated with family origin, all the way back to the beginning of the tribe. That is followed by folus, which is about 
family matters going back to the great grandparent generation, me plus three is Volus, going all the way back to the great grandparents. And Volus also has implications associated with alcohol and, and the passing of alcohol related tendencies down the generations. Now, um, normally when something is about alcohol, alcohol, we might say, well, this could, this could influence other uh, mind-altering or, or addictive substances. I just have not seen that over the years I've been working um, with Folis, and I, I have been doing so since the thing was named or soon after. I probably started working with Folis in 1998. It was discovered in, in 1992, and I got lucky, and I, I got mixed up with the astrologers who were doing the best work on the centaurs. Dieter Koch and Robert von Heeren wrote a book in German about Folis, the only book written about Folis, the second centaur, forgot to mention that. So first came Chiron in 1977, opens up the field of healing astrology, then comes Folis, the second centaur. And I happened to be living in Germany, and I had the privilege of being with a girlfriend who had phenomenal skills in both German and English. She's a German speaker from Bavaria, but she, but her English was quite excellent. And so she, we, 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 night after night, we, we would uh, together read chapters of Fo Folus Wanderer between Saturn and Neptune, and she would translate it. And so um, I, I have the benefits of Robert von Heeren's work. And so Folus is the small cause with the big effect. Folus is like popping the champagne bottle, all the champagne comes out, or you drop the Mentos into the bottle of Pepsi, an experiment I must try. I keep saying that every time I do a podcast where I talk about Folus. I'm like, yeah, I've got to try that. Get a pack of Mentos and a two-liter bottle of soda and see if it's really true that the thing ejects uh, the soda like four feet in the air when you drop a couple of Mentos in there. That is Folus. It is also the principle that you cannot put the shaving cream back in to the can. So it's anything that is released that does not come back. And, and what is released in the myth of Folus is a whole bunch of karma is unleashed four generations later, four generations after Folus, a demigod. I'm not sure he was, no, he was not an immortal, but very long lived, was uh, given the task of guarding this uh, vat of wine that was left to him by Dionysus. He was given the cave of Dionysus. So he was the keeper of Dionysus's cave, kind of like the long-term uh, re resident. And plus it came with a vat of wine that was the collective property of all of the centaurs. Heracles shows up. The, the, the vat of wine is opened and causes a big problem. Okay, so that's uh, that's that. Next is Ixion. And I describe all of this in detail in the article. I'm just here to get you warmed up to these ideas. Ixion, first human to commit murder in Greek mythology. And he stands for the principle of amorality and the squanderer of second chances. Amorality means no moral structure whatsoever. Absolutely no concept of right or wrong. What what you would expect from a premeditated murderer, premeditated rapist. They exist within their own, which he's both. He exists within his own value structure. And and we add the influence of Ixion to the family system. By the way, I forgot to mention that. This is all about the family system. It's all in Capricorn, and all of these points pertain to family Ixion, the least directly, but we see this, well, he kills his father-in-law, so it definitely has a familial inflection because he's killing his father-in-law. Killed his father-in-law. Then his friend Zeus invites him up to Mount Olympus, and he hatches a plot, get this, to rape Hera, queen of the gods. Now, this, as I said in, um, in the article, this should make a fundamentalist Christian Bible scholar nervous. The mere words... The plan to rape Hera, queen of the gods? Well, she's clever. She reproduces herself as a kind of a cloud formation. Um, uh, Ixion, I, I, love, I love Greek myth. They're so dreamy. He, he or nightmarish. He, he rapes the cloud formation and, this, and gives birth to Centaurus, who then gives birth to the race of centaurs, except for Chiron and Pholus. They have different lineage. They're not from that Ixion 
cloud formation, Hera, Centaurus, uh, uh, lineage. This is all kind of again. It's very dreamy um, and uh, and and hazy. The 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 myths. The re- I was reading the book. Uh, I got about halfway through, and then it just kept repeating itself. Called um, the breakdown, the origins of consciousness, and the breakdown of the bicameral mind. And this uh, this writer, and the book is worth attempting to read, I think. Uh, but this writer uh, pr- presents the, the, the Greek myths as almost like the the dead speaking to us in the form of a dream. And so this this shifted my perspective of what these myths are about. Okay, so we've got uh, so far. I've got Quayar family all the way back to the origin of the tribe. Tholus four generations back. Ixion Burge's father-in-law. Uh, and now, Cupido, a strange point without a body, a hypothetical planet, I believe like a 260-something year orbit, uh, perfectly circular. Again, it does not exist. It's merely a concept, but it represents family and gathering of all kinds. Hmm, interesting. So we've got another point associated with family, gathering in Capricorn, a sign of family legacy, the sign of ancestral and family legacy. And into this group, all concentrated within a few degrees in early Capricorn, Ceres is coming. Ceres is retrograde. Now, Ceres passed through the territory in March. And then it went out to mid-Capricorn station retrograde. And because of the retrograde, it's going to be moving real slow. And so it's going to come all the way back in and all the way back into this thing and just basically sit there all summer and into the autumn uh, because that's what happens when a fairly close by inner planet, in the case of Ceres, four-year orbit goes retrograde. Ceres is about all of those emotional issues between mothers and daughters. It Think of Ceres when you, when you see, you're walking around, maybe you go to the store, go to the mall, go someplace else, and you see an adult or, or, or a young adult or, or 20-something grafted to her mother. Now men don't act like this. There are no there are no young adult boys uh, that walk around grafted to their father. It just does not happen. They will walk with their father. They they may slap their dad on the back, uh, they, but they will be standing around like the other men when if if you have a father a son and a couple of friends standing around talking or walking together, you're not going to be able to say, oh, that's a father and a son. But when you when you look at a mother and a daughter, you will see that there is a grafted on quality that they often have. That is series. It's about these tethers between mothers and daughters. Additionally, series uh, represents all matters related to food, and we know how food in, infiltrates the whole question of food, infiltrates the whole emotional scene and all, all of the stress eating and the, the way that our diets are established and set up and all, all of this. So series can represent food, and it can represent food crisis. And we're watching a make-believe food crisis going on in the news. I don't know if your doom feed is, is uh, telling you anything about this H5N1 alleged bird flu. It's a complete fucking joke. All of my work on COVID, um, which um, I still have some friends, <laughs> I still have some subscribers left after all that. All of my work on COVID uh, demonstrated one thing mainly, which is that the polymerase chain reaction, excuse me, the reverse transcriptase, real time polymerase chain reaction, aka PCR, cannot find a virus. And part of why it cannot find a virus is because, first of all, it can't. But second, there's no virus to find. They use computer code to prime the thing. And they say, go and find this little stretch of 30 base pairs of computer code. And then they lie and say they found a virus. Well, that's what they're doing with uh, with this avian influenza thing. And they're testing milk and testing cattle. And, you know, they, they, they practically boil the milk that goes to the store. They shock it with heat so much that they basically turn it into plastic. And there, there is, even if viruses existed as these little random strands of genetic material that could jump into a cell and cause a disease and make it a factory and make other little strands of virus, which they've never, ever, once, ever in medical history, scientific history, ever fucking shown can happen. It's 
purely speculative. It is will-o'-the-wisp. Pasteurization would murder it dead. But no, we have to be stressed all the time. So they're trying to make a food crisis. And they're trying to make a food crisis that notably pushes more grains on people. A plant-based diet means all of this synthetic crap coming out of plants like Impossible Burgers. Well, it, it, that, that shit to me sounds about as digestible as a McDonald's shake. Well, it has to be good. It's protein. Well, uh, no, not necessarily. You're a lot better off eating prime rib, except that some people don't like to eat that. That's another question. But in any event, Ceres is backing into this configuration. And so we're going to see some emotional drama around food this summer. And where I didn't get in this article this week, and the article goes, let's see how many words I'm at. It, it's, it's not the old school 5,000 word Planet Waves article. It's the new school, rarely ever seen, 2,700 word. This breaks, this breaks a record for, for the last couple of years for a Planet Waves Thursday essay, 2,700 words. Uh, I realized, wow, well, I'm not quite, I'm not quite getting to the point here. I'm going to have to do that in, in part two. But part two is, I will, I will um, introduce this idea here. It's not, it's not original, but it uh, is an original reading of this astrology. The idea here is that the that the family contains all of the crisis of society. That the family, in the words of Wilhelm Reich, is the miniature authoritarian state. It is where we are conditioned to behave ourselves. And by the way, Reich's theory of sexual repression is, is not so much about how uh, <clears throat> the perception that, that people think that sex is bad or immoral as much as it is the idea that People who are curious <clears throat> are also sexual. People who are creative are also sexual. <clears throat> and creative, curious people tend to annoy people who are not creative <clears throat> and curious. And so the thing to do is to squash them. And that is Reich's concept of the emotional plague. And so we get a lot of emotional plaguing going on in families. We get a lot of this mishigas coming from down the generations. We get a lot of this, the, 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 the results of alcohol abuse coming down the generations. And until basically almost every family is a hot fucking mess. And then, the, then the, these little pods, these little, <clears throat> these little seed pods known as the family spew forth all of their people who have been imprinted by all the neurosis of their great-grandparents and whatever, whoever Ixion is in the family. And we have, we have society that, that basically just recopies all of the Mishigas of families. That, that, is the, that is the short summary of part two. Um, <clears throat> yet to be written, uh, but you can count on the fact that it will be. And I think that is most of what I have uh, to say uh, to you today. Uh, please buy the Trust Yourself reading. It will be worth it. And uh, it will motivate me to do more and and um, help support Planet Waves in a time when um, business is a little bit slow. I am going to play a hot show in Trust Yourself. Also, the Cancer birthday reading will be coming in about a week. That is called Art is everything. This is a special. I'm doing this one in audio also. I'm getting sick of doing these video readings. If you, if you, if enough people complain, I'll add, uh, I'll add video. Maybe do it both. But I think I'm better uh, sitting behind the microphone uh, than I am staring into a camera. Not that I mind being photographed. I kind of like it. But in this case, uh, you don't really need to look at me. But if you like to. Uh, there's a lot of pictures on the internet. Okay, so that's what I have to say. Have yourself a positively wonderful weekend. We are uh, going to upload this uh, as, as preview so that everyone can listen to it. 
Um, I realize you have a lot of things you can subscribe to on the internet. Most people listening to this are subscribers. Some are picking it up on various podcasting platforms um, around the internet and places. Like, Hello, by the way, if that's you. I forget to keep welcoming all the all the brand newcomers. But it is worth subscribing to my stuff. Uh, I, I bring a dedication and an artfulness to my published materials that I really don't see very many people doing. I have an editorial consistency and a depth of uh, a, a depth of, of my of my message uh, that I do my best to present in the most pleasant and engaging way without veering into it being infotainment. And the other thing I don't do that I really wish more people, it's really pretty much me and Sam Bailey who have this philosophy, is to not terrorize people, to not frighten people, to not um, in, induce fear with confusion. Sam Bailey, the, the most together Pisces woman that I've ever met, <laughs> with uh, her fabulous husband, Mark Bailey, down in New Zealand, if they're listening, which they probably are not, uh, I, I love them both. And check out their stuff. If you want some stuff that is grounded, not mindfuckery, scientifically relevant, socially and historically relevant, but really pleasant, Sam Bailey is nice to listen to and nice to look at. And Mark Bailey is right off camera with his pickaxe chopping up the rocks and making the research uh, di digestible. The most dedicated research team since me and Cindy Tice for Agusa. All right, I will, I will stop talking uh, for now. Looking forward to Planet Waves back, Planet Waves FM coming back online in a week. I will catch you before then with a new Planet Waves on Thursday next. All right, once again, thanks for joining me. Lots of love and bye for now.